Hi, I am José Valim, creator of Elixir and co-founder of Platform Attack. When I was about eight, ten years old, I had like the first computer at home, which is, in a way, it's like kind of privilege. It was uh, relatively early on, and because my mother she was studying data processing, and I was able to play a little bit. So I remember like uh, very early, maybe you know, getting one of her books and trying to do things through, like in in Visual Basic or something like that. But it would be like you know. It would be like, I would try for two days and I was a clueless kid. I actually didn't know what was happening. I remember way back then there was also, I was probably around 14. Um, we had something, I don't know, I don't think a lot of people remember this, but it was like Mujang. It was like a, a, a tool, a library, a framework, I don't know even how to call it, where you could create your own fighting game. So people, they would like design the characters and people design the stages and then you could download that and you could customize it. Again, it was not really programming, but I, I think it's not necessarily programming how we call it, but the whole idea of tinkering, like try to make, put things together and see how they are going to work, um, kind of contributes to the whole idea. And then I would have to change some files that were definitely like source code files for some language that I don't recall. But like programming, programming for real, it was on my first year of univers university. We had, I had uh, classes in C and this time was like, it was in the blackboard, right? So the, we didn't have a computer with us all the time. So the, uh, the, the professor, he would write the programs in the blackboard. We, when we would do the exams, we would write the programs in a piece of paper. And then from there, uh, on the first year of university, I met some friends and, um, and we had a band and I decided to, to make a website for the band in the timing in Flash, Action Script, this kind of stuff uh, during the, the, the vacation. And that was like the first time I actually made something programming out of my own. So the first language I became like really proficient, really confident uh, with uh, was Ruby. And what I really like about Ruby was really this ability to to explore kind of in a way where the language is unrestricted and you can just try out different things and the language is very um, flexible like you can change it in many different ways that was really what attracted me to Ruby at the time and when I started with Ruby it was because Rails was like this big sensation right and Rails was exactly leveraging this kind of features that that Ruby provides. If we go back like to my first computer that I said that I got like when I was like eight, 10 years old, um, it was a powerful computer at the time, but like two years later or not even that, I would have a colleague in the classroom that, so I had like a Pentium 100 and they would be like, I have a Pentium 233. And then I was like, how come? Like we barely got this computer, we barely finished paying it. How come you have a machine that's more than two times faster than mine? And, and that's because the computers are always getting like twice faster every two years. But now this is no longer true. So what is happening is that we have machines with two, four, eight, uh, 64 cores. So there was already this uh, I, I started to see this this movement of the interest of having machines running in multiple cores. And as I read more about it, it was clear that we we're going to a multi-core future. We are not going to be running on very powerful machines with one core. We're going to have a bunch of cores and we need to find a good way to write software that leverages all of those two cores. And, you know, working with Rails at the time, so sometimes we would make things faster and what would happen is that like we would improve things, but some, someone would do a bug report saying, hey, uh, we are running this new version. And when like they are under very specific situations, we would have a bug and this bug would be hard to reproduce uh, and hard to fix. And that's not really fault of uh, Rails per se. I'm not criticizing Rails, but it's just a natural way of how uh, we would write software uh, in languages like Ruby, Java, C because the thing that changes with multi-core and that's why it has such a, a big impact in the industry is because when you have one core, you have like just, just one thing running at the same time. But when you have two cores, you can have like two things running at the same time. 
and then you have to answer the question like what happens if those two things run at the same time they try to do the same thing or try to change the same place in memory they try to uh, re handle the same resource at the same time so we call it race condition because it's just when like those two happen to do the same thing at the same time like which may not happen at all but may happen all the time you just don't know so yeah so i was in that situation i was like okay so uh, if these if multi-cores become important and it's kind of hard to for me to tackle those problems now what solutions do i have so uh, before i started Lixi, i started first just looking for solutions like you know we have this i have this problem how is the best way to solve it and then i like to say there were like two points of no return in this like journey of finding solutions where where i felt like you know what I, maybe i have to change the way i write software altogether and the first one was when i found uh, functional programming for example i said like we have two cores running at the same time and then what happens when they try to change the same place so in functional programming we stop thinking about changing things we think more about transformation and that was like the first uh, revelation to me was like wait if I was thinking about transformations all the time all this software that I wrote in the past that I knew that I know now had those kind of concurrency bugs all this software it would just work it would not, like the whole problem would disappear which is which is the best way to solve a problem right because you can find a solution to the problem but if you can make the problem disappear altogether then yeah I'll take that so that was the first point and the second point was when I found the Erlang virtual machine which is the platform that Elixir runs on top of because if you if you look at the last 10 years a lot of the languages they're all focusing on concurrency and 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 that's good that's great right so they're all focusing oh we, what if we have multiple cores but there is a point when you're writing a software when you're writing a system where one machine is not enough right if you have a powerful machine with 64 cores you want to you, you want to use everything in that machine as efficiently as possible but a lot of the times you have to use like three machines four machines you have a cluster right so while everyone was thinking about how can we solve the concurrency and all those things running on a single machine Erlang had already solved that problem and the the problem that Erlang uh, is focused on is like well, well what if you have multiple machines as well so to me Erlang was always ahead of the curve when I look at that I thought well you know it's great like if they already solved this and they're already working on the next problem that's where i want to be at so so that's so when i was at that point i did not know like that elixir would be a thing but inside of me i i've kind of felt like it was the moment in my career where i was changing paths i i had to do i had to try something else because with that information that i that i gained i felt like okay there are um, other areas to explore and to venture into so I did explore both when I figured out that I wanted to explore more functional programming languages and also when I decided I actually want to try writing a programming language so there was a period where I was really trying a bunch of different things even languages that um, they are not really mainstream or known sometimes niche languages that uh, focus on very particular ideas so for example there is this language called uh, Frank which is all about having um, better way for working with units of measure. So I tried with a bunch of different things, a bunch of different functional programming languages to get ideas from them and see uh, what um, what makes sense to Elixir. I think um, Clojure, for example, was uh, uh, really helpful with that. So there are um, there are features in Elixir that are they are heavily inspired from features uh, in Clojure. We of course have some ideas that come from Haskell or naming coming from Haskell and the reason why I like I didn't go to those languages exactly because um, what won me was the Erlang virtual machine as a platform that was what I wanted like I want to write software to this platform it doesn't really matter how or what I, I want it here <laughs> I didn't meet the the, the creators of Erlang uh, Joe Mike and Robert and they were always very welcoming, uh, very nice. Sometimes we would uh, get to talk about technical challenges. And Robert, for example, he has a bunch of other languages running in Erlang Virtual Machine. So sometimes I would ask him questions and sometimes he would be like, oh, how we implemented this in Elixir? I'm considering it for this other language. So we, you know, whenever, whenever uh, we had the opportunity to meet, we would have really 
uh, great conversations. And I also met the, the Erlang OTP team, not the whole team. They're also very welcoming, you know, very open to discuss ideas, which is really nice, right? Because you don't, you don't feel like you are working against something. And so today Erlang is maintained by Ericsson and they have a team inside Ericsson, the OTP team that maintains it. And I was able to to meet uh, different developers from th this team at different periods of time. But I remember that, uh, so when Elixir first uh, came out, it had a little of a pushback, exactly because, you know, why a new programming language, right? What is the point? And one of their developers sent me an email saying, you know, don't listen, like just continue doing whatever you're doing. And that was a, a really, I think, maybe powerful advice, but reassuring, you know, like, you know, at the end, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. If it works, it works. You know, just just go ahead, continue what you're doing and um, have fun while you're doing it. So one of the things that helped me a lot is because I had a target. The Arling Virtual Machine was my target and it being a target, it has like things that you can do and things that you can't. So a lot of the times, if I saw a feature in a language that, uh, that I like, like protocols in Clojure, which is something that we added to Elixir, I was like, okay, how would I implement this uh, in, in the context of the Erlang Virtual Machine, which is a very reduced problem, right? Compared to starting a language from scratch where you're doing everything from scratch is a much bigger challenge. And it's also, I like to say, it's also when you start adding enough things, it's kind of a, like a little bit of a, a Jenga game, you know, the Jenga where you have to take the pieces and it doesn't fall because uh, it's never like you add this and you add this and those are two separate things. Everything has kind of a overlap. So you can add something that impacts something elsewhere. So, um, so that's something that you also need, to, need to, to be aware when you're creating a language. And what helps that is to kind of like define an overall goal, like what you actually want this language to be and which kind of software you want it to write. And then it helps because when you never have a question like, should this part of the language or not? You can always look at this overall goal and say, wait, does it fit my goals or not? My first prototype for Elixir, if you want to feel adventures, you can actually go to the GitHub and go way back in time. Um, it was like, it didn't work. The reason why the prototype failed is because the, at the beginning, I was really trying to have like Ruby in the Erlang virtual machine. So I was like, just trying to bring behavior or features that we have in Ruby into the Erlang virtual machine. And that did not work for, because they're really, really incompatible in a bunch, in a bunch of ways. And, and, and of course, at the end, that did not work. And uh, the important lesson, for example, that I learned with these mistakes, that instead of trying to, to say, well, let's just bring this over, I would ask, like, why do I want to bring this over? And what I'm going to, to, to gain with this? And then, because then I could think about the problem in general. I was like, oh, I want to bring this over because it allows me to do this. But maybe there are other things that allow me to do that. So I would be able to say, okay, so now I know what I'm looking for. So I can look at different solutions and choose the one that I think is best. So that's one process that uh, I think uh, I was really strong when I was designing the language and when I made these mistakes and that I carry this process with me today still. Let's say if I wanted the language to be used by other people, I would have to go out and I would talk about it. I could write like the greatest language in the world and if I didn't tell anybody, it doesn't have, a, it doesn't make a purpose, right? Like nobody would use it. I knew that I would have to go, I would have to go to events, I would have to talk to people, to talk to people about it, to have to write about it. And I think, for example, like Rails has this idea of marketing really uh, well in place. They, they know that, right? They know that they have to talk about it. They have to get people excited. They have to get people involved. So I would say it's something that I knew I had to do it. And I knew because of my previous experiences in the open source community as well. The best ideas that Elixir uh, has, it came from Erlang and that allowed us as a language because we had this great foundation and that allowed us to focus on very specific things for Elixir itself. So what Elixir adds on top of like, it's a very great tooling. So that's something that I knew kind of knew from the beginning 
that's something that we would also have to focus on. Sure, I would have to go and talk to people about it, but I also know that we need to have a great tooling. Like it should be easy for you to say, because I could go give a talk and a conference and then people would get home and like, I want to try this and they would get stuck. They would not be able to get started or do anything. So I know, you know, the getting started experience should be like, should be simple. It should be accessible. It should be easy. You should get from zero to something running like relatively fast. So, so that's something that Elixir focused as a language being very welcoming. And also because education in general or computer science in general or you know, programming in general, they, they do not focus on functional programming languages. They are not the majority. So I knew that people would have to learn a bunch of different things. They have to learn about functional programming. They have to learn about concurrency, right? So I wanted to ease this learning curve as much as possible. Every day when I'm working, I try to be no distractions as possible. So unless it's important, there's pretty much like no way for her to reach out to me and interrupt the work I'm doing at the moment. And also if you have a source, like, you know, for example, I know that like things like Hacker News, Reddit, which are great, but you know, if you have this place that you go, it's always like, you always have a five minutes break that becomes a one hour and a half break because you always have this go-to place, right? Uh, for you to kind of check things out. So uh, yeah, I try to not have those so I can really, let's say, have a clear mind and be focused on whatever it's doing. And if I'm going to learn something, I, there is a topic, I've searched a bunch of papers, and if I have to read, I, I take like a Kindle or something that has no internet, nothing to distract, and I read those things calmly and patiently. I will continue involved as it is right now, but you know, it's like before there's always the pressure, like there is this next thing, there is this next thing, there is the next thing. And now, you know, there's not necessarily this next thing. So I can have like, let's say more cycles off in a sense, right? But I, I would say I would still be involved as I have been all along. Mm -hmm.